Uh, hello, thank you all very much for coming and uh, welcome to this session on uh, creating high performance spatial databases with SQL Server 2008. Um, come in, come in. <laughs> uh, I'll start by introducing myself. My name's Alistair Aitchison. I'm an independent consultant. I'm based in Norwich, in Norfolk, uh, and I've got a particular interest in spatial databases and spatial applications, typically using SQL Server 2008 as a back end, and then um, applications such as Google Earth or uh, Big Maps as sort of front end interfaces into that data. Um, I'm also the author of two books on SQL Server. Um, beginning Spatial with SQL Server 2008, which was published at the beginning of this year, and uh, Expert SQL Server 2008 Development, which is actually due out in a few weeks, um, which I co-authored uh, with a guy called Adam Mackinick. Um, some of the material from this session is going to be based on some of the content from those books, and some of it's brand new. Um, so there should be something new for everyone, whether you've seen that or not before. Um, this is my first time presenting at SQL Bits, so I'm very pleased to be here. I'm um, good to see lots of people here as well. Um, we'll see how it goes. <clears throat> so if we have a look at the session plan, uh, this session is going to be looking at uh, the spatial features in SQL Server 2008, particularly from a performance point of view. Okay, so um, the first thing we're going to look at is a little bit about the different models you can use to store spatial data in SQL Server 2008, and going to ask the question, do you actually need to use the geometry and geography data types? Um, now, when you're talking about spatial performance, that's uh, intricately linked to the subject of spatial indexes. So we're going to be spending quite a bit of time looking at spatial indexes, both from a sort of a theoretical point of view, and then also going to look at a practical point of view as to how the query processor actually uses spatial indexes to satisfy spatial queries. And then we're going to move on to actually, um, you know, practical tips that you can take away and, uh, and implement when you get back to, to improve the speed of your queries. Um, now, this is a level 400 session, so I'm not going to be doing the introductory sort of explanation of the difference between geometry and geography. I'm hoping that you've got a general awareness of these two types anyway. Um, if you do have any questions, there will be the opportunity for questions at the end of the session, and I'll be hanging around afterwards if you want to come up and ask me anything afterwards. Um, now, some of the sessions here at SQL Bits have been very demo heavy. They're very kind of, you know, look at the application in action. Uh, this session is going to be quite uh, PowerPoint based. I'll, I'll set your expectations now. Uh, one of the reasons for this is I find when you're thinking about spatial data, um, it's human nature to think in terms of sort of graphical terms of you know, maps and how things overlap each other. So it's slide based, but there's quite a lot of diagrams. And what I'm actually going to do is step through some spatial queries and try to use diagrams to explain what's going on at each stage of the, um, the query process when you run a spatial query. OK, so um, we'll start at the beginning. And uh, the first question is, do you actually need to use geometry and geography? <coughs> now, it's long been possible to store spatial data in SQL Server. Um, if you were to try and store spatial data in uh, 2000 or 2005, for instance, this is one of the uh, basic models you might have used. So what we've got here is a customer's table. And um, we've got two decimal columns at the bottom which are used to store a latitude and longitude associated with each of our customers. Um, now, this is not the only model you could have used. It's possible to store binary data. Um, sort of well-known binary format is a, a standard format you could have used. But this is a fairly common one that you, you might have seen and you might be using at the moment. And how can you use that kind of data? Well, using this model, it's possible to answer question, questions like, um, which of our customers are located in a certain area of space. Um, the query on this slide does that. So select star from customers where lat between lat min and lat max and long between long min and long max. This represents the red rectangle area you see on the map here. Um, the minimum latitude and longitude is located at the bottom left hand corner and the top right is the maximum of both values. 
Now, obviously, this has got some limitations. Um, the biggest one being it really only works for rectangular areas of space. Um, if you wanted to ask the question of which of our customers lies within a county boundary or a country or a complex polygon, you can't really do that using that approach. What else can you do with the, the two model format, uh, the two column model, sorry? Well, you can calculate the distance between two points. Um, the formula shown on this slide uh, uses something called the spherical law of cosines. This is not the only uh, way you can approach it. There's another common method called the Haversine method. And what this does is it calculates the distance between two points on a sphere, essentially. Um, that constant at the beginning, 3963, that's the radius of the Earth in miles. So if you use this formula, you'll get a distance between two points in miles calculated on a perfect sphere. Now, again, this has got problems with it um, because the world is not a perfect sphere. Um, it's uh, an oblate spheroid is the technical word, which basically means it's a sphere that's been squashed a bit. Um, but it's still, you know, a, a reasonable approximation for many for many cases, and it doesn't need geometry and geography. Now, the limitations, then, of, of this two-column model. Well, one of the limitations is the fact that because we are only storing a single coordinate value with each row of data, you can really only use it to store point locations in space. You can't store, for instance, routes or areas, polygons, very easily, at least, anyway. Um, the calculations on which those coordinates can then be used are normally either based on a flat plane. For instance, if you were storing uh, here in the Great Britain, you could be storing national grid coordinates, in which case you do calculations on a flat plane. Or, as in the spherical law of cosines method on the last slide, you can perform calculations on a perfect sphere. But both of these are approximations, so you're going to introduce approximations into results. And also, there's a fairly limited range of methods. We've seen how to work out the distance between two points and whether a point is contained within a rectangle. But if you wanted to do more complicated spatial queries, it gets pretty intensive to try to write that in, in T-SQL. So at this point, along comes SQL Server 2008. And in SQL Server 2008, not only can we store points, we can store line strings, so a connected series of, of points, we can also store polygons, and we can store complex shapes, so we can have polygons with holes in them, and we can have multi-polygons and geometry collections. And SQL Server 2008 stores spatial data as a CLR UDT type, which means that every individual item of spatial data can be up to two gigabytes in size, um, and that's sufficient to get uh, you know, even the outline of most countries at a reasonable level of, of detail. So you can get pretty complicated shapes. And when you perform uh, calculations using spatial methods of the geometry and geography data types, those methods uh, perform calculations based on a spatial reference system. Now, for geography, um, the spatial reference system basically defines the shape of the Earth onto which you're doing your calculations. There's lots of approximations of shapes of the Earth. The one that you're probably most commonly familiar with is um, something called the WGS84 model, um, which is what's used by global positioning systems, amongst other things. But there's lots of other models. Um, the NAD83 model in America is a very common geographic model of the Earth. Um, and if you're using the geometry data type, there's also lots of spatial reference systems you can use. You can use uh, state plane coordinate systems, or you can use the national grid here, or in other European countries have national grids as well. So we get much more accurate calculations than we used to be able to do. And thirdly, um, when Microsoft chose to implement the spatial features in SQL Server 2008, they did so based on the Open Geospatial Consortium Simple Features for SQL specification. Now, the Open Geospatial Consortium, or OGC, this is a cross-industry body um, which sets standards for spatial features used in Oracle and IBM and SQL Server. Microsoft joined the OGC as a principal partner, and the methods that you use in SQL Server are compatible with the definitions defined by the OGC across these other data sets as well. So not only can you do simple intersects queries or work out the distance between points, 
you can work out whether one polygon is contained within another, for instance, or whether a line crosses over a polygon. Or um, there's something called the DE9IM, which is the Dimensionally in Extended Nine Intersection Model. And what that is, essentially, is that it's a, a mathematical model that allows you to find complex relationships between any two geometries. So at this point, you might think it's a, a bit of a no-brainer um, if you want to implement spatial features in SQL Server 2008, let's use geometry and geography. They're capable of storing more complex data, they're more accurate, and they've got better functionality. As ever, it's not quite that simple. Um, those enhanced features and that enhanced complexity comes at a cost. And the cost is that spatial queries are probably going to be among the most complex and the slowest queries you're going to run on SQL Server 2008. Um, we're going to look at how you can make them faster in just a second. But the, the first question really to ask yourselves, and my first performance tip as it were, is to ask whether you really need to use all those spatial features or whether you can make do with the two column model which you've been able to use for a long time. Not all spatial applications um, need to use geometry and geography. For example, uh, it's very common to have a web page with a store locator type functionality. So you type your postcode in and what you get back is the results of your closest three stores or whatever features they are uh, together with the distance away from your location that they are. Now for that example um, each location is only represented as a single point in space. The calculations themselves can be fairly approximate. We're not looking for high accuracy. And in that case, you will, I can almost guarantee you, you will get better performance using the old model than you will do using geometry and geography. Um, another example, I don't know if any of you were in the uh, Bing Maps presentation this morning, but um, it's quite common now to see a web page where users can browse around a map and the map goes back to SQL Server and returns a list of uh, points of interest located in the currently visible map screen, for instance. Now, because that's a rectangular viewport. Um, the fastest way to retrieve all the information from the database that lies in that viewport is to use that simple rectangular bounding query we saw earlier, um, where the latitude lies between the minimum and the maximum, and the, and the longitude lies between the minimum and the maximum. That will almost certainly, with the correct index placed on those columns, give you the best performance. So that's, uh, that's the answer to your performance problems. Don't use geometry and geography. Unfortunately, that's probably not going to satisfy most of you, and you're looking for a slightly better answer than that. So let's move on and um, look at the next.